Well before the pharaohs of Egypt, a mysterious civilization of unknown origins appeared. It developed in the Balkans, between the Danube and the Aegean Sea, mainly in present-day Bulgaria. Then it disappeared 2,000 years ago. Today, this civilization continues to yield fabulous treasures and to transform our knowledge of the history of mankind. In 1972, on the shores of the Black Sea, near Varna, one of the most sensational discoveries of the 20th century was made. A necropolis dating back to 4,500 years BC, containing more than 300 tombs. It unearthed the oldest gold artifacts ever discovered. More than 1,000 diadems, ornaments, bracelets, jewels made from bone and shell, as well as copper tools, were laid alongside the corpses in the tombs. Pictograms, a primitive form of writing, and clay vases, which must be admired for their craftsmanship and their decorative detail, were also found. Some of these tombs did not contain bones. They are symbolic tombs called cenotaphs. In one of them, this clay depiction of a human face was found. We can make out the forehead adorned with a diadem, the ears with rings, the eyes and the mouth depicted by gold plates. It was a society divided into three social classes with many nobles in whose tombs finely worked gold objects are found. This discovery also raises questions. What are the origins of this puzzling and fascinating civilization? How did these populations evolve on European territory? How was their everyday life organized? What occurred in this region is fundamental, since this is where agriculture and livestock breeding first came to be, and thus where the first farmers appeared. This is where the passage from a civilization of hunter-gatherers to a civilization of stock breeders and farmers took place, where the first geographically settled villages appeared, and then, a little later, came the first fortified settlements, war, the beginning of social hierarchy. These phenomena continued to evolve and the populations gradually differentiated from each other. So, the Thracians emerged in the area of current-day Bulgaria, the Celts in the west, the Germanic tribes in the north, the Greeks in the south, and so on. The first phase was the appearance of agriculture and of livestock breeding in a certain number of points around the world, no more than six or seven, independently from one another between 5,000 and 10,000 BC. The houses which were built 8,000 years ago have remained practically unchanged until present day. They are rectangular or square two-room homes built out of earth or stone. Agriculture was based on wheat and barley, which at the time only grew wild in the Middle East, and which were not domesticated until 9 to 10,000 years ago in the Middle East, and it would then it was brought to Europe. Similarly, sheep and goats only lived in the wild in the Middle East and were also imported into Europe about 8,000 years ago. And this is a way of life with these rectangular homes, wheat, barley, sheep and goats, has gone nearly unchanged until present day. In the middle of the house, there is an oven that today can still be found in traditional houses in this region. It was used to cook flour, meat, and all the meals. And then there are traces of the hearths which were used for heating since it is an area where it still can be rather cold in the winter. And all these techniques can be found practically unchanged even to this day. According to sources in antiquity, the Thracian population was made up of various tribes, 
with its fortresses, its temples, and its priest kings. What they had in common went beyond the organization of a state and was unique in Thrace. Language, beliefs, the rationale guiding their actions, their aspirations, and their spiritual life. As archaeologists and astronomers, we see that the position of the main rock, put in a particular way with a precise face, is placed exactly so that the rays of the sun hit it the day of the summer solstice and the day of the equinox. That proves that this site is, without any doubt, a place of worship. This site predates Stonehenge, the well-known megalithic site of England. Such monuments of worship cut into the rock and dating from the same period exist in Rodops in the south of Bulgaria and elsewhere in the world, such as Armenia, for example. These structures facing the sun bring to mind the first pyramids of the Egyptians, the Mayas, and the Aztecs. This rock carved in the Rhodopus Mountains close to the Greek border still remains an enigma with various interpretations. This monolithic block is cut in the shape of a pyramid. It is one of the best-preserved sacred temples in Southeast Europe and Asia Minor. A sarcophagus is carved on its point. It is etched with grooves, which are used to allow liquids to run off towards the canyon. But what are these liquids? Is it an altar, a place of sacrifice, or perhaps a place of worship dedicated to wine and Dionysus? Is there a link between this 3,000-year-old site and the solar calendar? The mystery remains unsolved. Whatever the case, the local population continues to venerate this place and even claims that the flowers picked at the foot of the monument have healing virtues. In 1925, two brothers from the village of Valchitran in northern Bulgaria were digging in their vineyard. Suddenly, a spade hit metal. They dug up several containers and lids blackened by earth, all of which they abandoned except for one. They brought it back to the village to use as a trough for the pigs. The animals licked the metal until it shone, revealing solid gold of 23 carat purity. They immediately returned to find other objects. Arguments followed, so they cut up the pieces and shared them. Part of the treasure was to disappear for good. After the police came, the Archaeological Museum of Sofia recovered this extraordinary discovery, which weighed in at 12 and a half kilos. It dates back to 1500 BC, that is to say, more than five centuries before Moses is supposed to have been alive. Were these objects of incredible beauty used in the practice of rituals? And for which rituals? Who were the skilled goldsmiths who shaped these treasures of such exceptional beauty? To whom did they belong? Why were they hidden? Was it to flee from danger or to make a gift of them to the earth, the goddess mother? 
Historians' answers differ. The Valchitran treasure will remain a mystery for a long time to come. Between the treasure of Varna, dating from the 5th millennium BC, and that of Valtitran, 3,000 years later, the land of the Thracians has yielded few secrets. Nothing, or almost nothing, has been discovered. What happened during these two millennia? The emergence of the Thracian kingdom must be understood in relation to Europe's larger history at the time, in the first millennium BC. In the south, around the Mediterranean, there were powerful states, monarchies, urban systems, like in Egypt, Mesopotamia, Greece, and soon after, in Italy. Immediately to the north, there were intermediate populations like the Thracians, but also the Scythians, Celts, and Iberians, who were also strongly attracted to the southern countries. Greek art was to have a major influence on Thracian and Celtic art, for example, but these states were to also sometimes make their presence felt in the surrounding regions through invasions. And then fully to the north, I'm thinking of the Germanic tribes, for example, there were societies which continued the traditional way of life of the Neolithic era of the Bronze Age under the rule of warlords. However, there were few differences between these societies and they did not produce art for the elite. The entirety of Europe's history in the first millennium took place in these three regions. Who are the Thracians, really? Why do we know so little about their culture up to the present day? The Thracians did not leave writings. It is thanks to the texts of the ancient Greeks, Romans, and Byzantines that we have learned more about them. Their land bears the name of the legendary nymph Thrake. Thrake was a prophetess and healer. In the Iliad, Homer recounts the power of the Thracians, who were allied to the Trojans during the Trojan War. The recently arrived Thracians are a part, the last of all the others. And among them is their king, Rhesius Ineus. I saw his great and splendid horses. They are whiter than snow and run like the wind. And I saw his chariot, decorated in gold and silver, and his great golden weapons, a marvel to behold, and which were less suited to mortal men than to the immortal gods. Herodotus also emphasizes it in the 5th century BC. The Thracian people are, after the Indian people, the most numerous people of all. If they were under the command of only one chief, and if they were united, they would have been, in my opinion, invincible and stronger than all other peoples. Thrace is not a single people but a mosaic of tribes, such as the Odrysians, Getz, and the Trabali. Thucydides, a 5th century BC Greek historian, was accused of treason and condemned to death by the Athenians. He took refuge in Thrace, where he lived for 20 years. His family worked in the gold mines there. Thucydides was impressed by the Odrysian kingdom founded by Taras in 5th century BC. He writes, among the kingdoms of Europe which are located between the Ionian Sea and the Black Sea, that of the Odrysians is largest in terms of the size of its income and wealth. At the beginning of the 4th century BC, the royal Odrysian treasure was evaluated at 260 tons of objects made of metal and coins, amounts which were considerable for the time. Concerning Thracian know-how and arts that did not survive, such as dance, oral poetry, or even medical knowledge, we only know of this from legends and more recent texts. Thrace is presented as the land of the muses, the homeland of the first known musicians and poets. Orpheus, a central character of Thracian culture, is also a famous healer, the founder of a philosophy, religion preaching the union of nature with the universe.
In ancient times, the Thracians were known for their faith in immortality. The origin of this belief perhaps lies with the legendary king Zalmaxis. According to mythology, he had a room built underground, in the form of a mound of earth, and then had himself locked inside. Four years later, when he reappeared in the world of light, the Thracians were convinced of immortality. This faith in immortality contributed to their bravery, which is confirmed by all the authors of ancient times. Upon his death, the king was buried, and his tomb itself buried under an enormous mass of earth. Burial mounds are commonly found in Eurasia and in Mediterranean regions. They represent a model of the cosmos and symbolize the primitive hill of creation. Are they sanctuaries devoted to the divinity which may conceal sacred rooms? Recently, the Thracian mission for the study of burial mounds made a series of exceptional discoveries about 80 miles south of Sofia in an area baptized the Valley of the Thracian Kings. Several of these hills have yielded rich symbols of royal power. We observed that the large burial mounds were built with heaped earth and were used as sacred temples. Inside, the large burial mounds were laid out as temples. It is a tradition which comes from Mycene at the end of the Bronze Age. In Mycene, the burial mounds existed naturally and temples were dug inside. In Thrace, there are no natural hills. The Thracians thus built burial mounds in the countryside and made them sacred. They dug temples and used them to bury their kings. We know that Thras was a totalitarian society, ruled by a supreme chief. Below him there was the aristocracy, then the people, which created wealth for the community. The king had to prove his abilities every day, especially in relation to the nobility, because each nobleman could claim his place. The Thracians had kings but no capital. The best known city was Septopolis, founded by the Odrosian king Svet III in the 4th century BC. It is currently at the bottom of a dam reservoir in the valley of the Thracian kings. The city was built with a very modern system for the time. The streets intersected at right angles and had signs. It contained a fortress where the priest king resided. His palace also served as a temple. Obviously, the buildings and splendid temples of this city are the proof that at the time, Thras had a higher standard of living than other parts of Central and Western Europe. Here, a culture flourished. The kings wore armor and gold and silver helmets. The horses were more richly adorned than the people. They were buried in magnificent tombs, whereas at the time, in the rest of Europe, man practically lived underground, eating half-cooked meat out of wooden or clay bowls.
This splendid silver shin protector belonged to a warlike king. All its reliefs are gilded. The shin protector is to some extent a manual on Thracian mythology and religion. It will not be long in taking its place among the most famous artifacts in the world going back to this period. This gold crown is a splendid ornament, but also a royal attribute. On the central segment we recognize the goddess Nike, holding a similar crown, as well as a file. Twenty-nine gold rosettes adorn the crown. This archaeological find is classified among the most beautiful specimens of Tarotic art, that is to say, ancient metalwork. These two writings, made out of gilded silver, are unique. One of them represents several scenes, including a wild boar hunt. On the other, one can make out two griffins, tormenting an exhausted bull. This gold ring is of paramount importance. It testifies to the fact that we are looking at a royal tomb. This scene represents the nomination and establishment of the future king. The mother goddess gives him the scepter, the badge of the royal power. In this tomb, we also discovered silver brackets decorating a harness on which fabulous animals are depicted. Greek ceramics helped us to date this tomb with precision. Thus, we can locate it to the 4th century BC, approximately 350 to 340 BC. We suppose that it concerns one of the sons of the great Thracian king Kersablot, of whom it is known that he reigned on these lands and part of the territory of current northern Turkey. He met his death in a battle against Philip II of Macedonia. The desire to erect sumptuous monuments is common to all ancient civilizations. The last resting places of high-ranking men were intended to be imposing in order to emphasize their prowess after their death. The funerary area of the Valley of Kazanlak is in line with this logic. A certain number of them can be compared with the Macedonian monuments referred to as the Macedonian Monument Tombs. A great number of architectural and decorative elements are comparable with those found in the tomb of a great Macedonian king, Philip II, who was the father of Alexander the Great. In both cases, the tombs were constructed and covered with a mound of earth, called a tumulus. Inside, one also finds the same spaces, a funerary room preceded by a hall, and sometimes by a corridor and also by large carved marble doors. Moreover, on one of these monumental doors, one can observe two carved medallions depicting gold heads which recall known portraits of Alexander the Great. This is where the famous Thracian king Svet III was buried at the end of the 4th or the beginning of the 3rd century BC. This tomb temple is characterized by its imposing dimensions. The three rooms are built out of blocks of stone. This construction goes back 2400 years. Since then, the Balkans has been subject to devastating earthquakes and yet the stones are not damaged by any cracks. This proves the extraordinary knowledge of the Thracian architects. It is astonishing to learn that the ground was covered with a fabric carpet with gold thread that shined from a distance. A horse was sacrificed in this death chamber. Its skeleton remains intact. Here, the rituals for the burial of the king were carried out with many gold and copper objects of great value belonging to Greek and Thracian art. 
This round room with a dome symbolizing the earth and sky was empty. A sarcophagus was cut from a single block of more than 60 tons. This sarcophagus was cut horizontally and above the king's personal objects were laid out. On the left, his gold armor and the harness which decorated his horse. On the right, three large amphors, which undoubtedly were full of wine. Two silver goblets, on the edge of one of the goblets and on the handle of the other, we can see inscriptions indicating that these goblets belong to Svet. A gold crown was laid out on a ritual table. There was a flagstone on which the Thracian god Zagre was represented, as well as on the crown. Beside it, there was a kind of gold cup with two handles, the skifos and the two other gold objects. The greatest find in this tomb was a bronze statue representing a man's head. This extraordinary depiction shows a spiritual man with a rich inner life. It is magnificently carved. This head was found seven meters in front of the temple's facade, which made us realize that our research needed to be continued. Richly decorated, these tombs are mainly of two types, either in the shape of a cupola or in the shape of a shelter. They are built out of stone, sometimes out of brick. The two materials can be used together. The cupola, as the vault, represents the sky. These stone cupolas, sometimes covered with gold, symbolize the afterlife. Most of the time, the tombs are decorated frescoes of kings and royal families. One of the most famous tombs discovered by chance is that of Kazanlak. It is registered with UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. The king looks down from the walls while preparing his voyage into the afterlife, accompanied by a woman, fighting warriors, feasting guests, and charging chariots. These frescoes are most probably the work of the Greek masters, commissioned by King Sevt III. Who is the woman seated close to the king? His favorite, his wife, or the great goddess mother who will carry him into the kingdom beyond? Difficult to say for sure. In another tomb plundered by thieves and treasure seekers close to Alexandrovo in the south of Bulgaria, mythical royal hunts can be observed. The young princes are hunting on horseback, accompanied by their servants and their dogs. The Thracians were polygamous. Aristotle stated that each Thracian has three or four wives, but some have about thirty. When a lord dies, his wives dispute the privilege of being the favorite wife the only one who can accompany him on his funeral pier. The ancient authors admired their beauty. For the Thracians, marriage also had a political dimension. Women were bought or had richly dowries to seal alliances. Thracian princesses married foreign kings while the Thracian lords chose Greek women. According to the ancient text, it was the woman who maintained the worship of the divinities. That is perhaps what this extraordinary 3rd century BC tomb reveals. It was discovered in 1982 near Svechtari, 
in the area of the Danube in northern Bulgaria. This tomb presents a single architectural decoration. Ten caryatids with similar silhouettes but different faces surrounding the room. Above four of them, there is an unfinished mural. It depicts the great goddess mother, followed by four maidservants, tending offerings and a gold crown to a royal cavalry warrior. The general layout of the room is similar to that of Greek sculptures. Furthermore, the Thracians also adopted the Greek divinities, as is shown by the Panagorichte treasure. Discovered by chance in 1949, this treasure constitutes one of the most beautiful wine services ever, dating from the 3rd century BC. Nine containers in solid gold for a total weight of more than six kilos. The typical Thracian pitcher is called a riton. It was used to pour wine. It probably owes its form to the horns which were used to drink from. The surface was covered with figures representing the divinities, such as Artemis, Hera, or Nike. Here we have a drawing of Dionysus, sometimes considered to be of Thracian origin. Here, a scene from the Judgment of Paris. The Greek goddesses had asked Zeus to decide who among them was the most beautiful. Zeus, not wanting to take part in such delicate business, ordered Paris, the Trojan prince, to decide. Paris chose Aphrodite. To take their revenge, the goddesses fomented a plot which eventually led to the Trojan War. It is believed that the Panagorichte treasure is only a part of what was intended for royal feasts, or more probably, for religious rituals in a place of worship or the royal court. Le trésor découvert. The treasure, discovered in Rogazan in 1986, is also very interesting and fundamental to understanding the religious practices and the mythological representations of the Thracians. 165 silver containers were dug up in a vegetable garden. Their total weight comes to 20 kilos. About 50 of these vases bear inscriptions in Greek. These inscriptions reveal that the treasure belonged to the royal tribal dynasty between the 5th and 4th century BC and that several vases were used as diplomatic gifts. Experts have established that these objects belong to various services gathered over a long period of time to form a family treasure which was transmitted from one generation to the next. Some of them were probably made in the main residence of the Odrysian king. There were goldsmiths' workshops throughout Thrace from the 5th to the 3rd century BC. They were located in population centers, some near the active silver and gold mines.
finding that some of these individuals suffered from the same kinds of health problems that we do. For example, some of these individuals experienced fractures. Uh, this is an example of a fracture to the clavicle. This is another example of a fracture. This is uh, one of the bones of the arm. This typically occurs when an individual falls and puts out their hand to break their fall. We are also finding evidence of nutritional deficiencies and we are finding some lesions here which may indicate iron deficiency anemia. This was quite common in past populations, particularly populations that relied on agriculture. And we see this very commonly in parts of the world today as well. One of the things that trauma can tell us is whether or not the population had some medical knowledge. For example, if we see fractures in the long bones that are very well set, where the, the bone is very well aligned, that is, they knew how to set fractures. Knowing how to heal wounds proved to be essential because Thrace was a warrior civilization. Several objects discovered in the tombs of the Thracian kings confirmed their reputation of being warrior kings, including gold and bronze armor, helmets, weapons, horse decorations, and war chariots. They were constantly making war, summed up by the famous Thracian king Teres as follows. When I am not at war, I look like my stableman. And while war was not a series of glorious episodes, but rather an almost daily occupation, life followed its peaceful course and had its own heroes, the craftsmen, masons, and architects. Noble Thracians were covered in gold. They liked to adorn themselves with gold-like women, said the Greeks, to make fun of them. These ornaments, pendants, pectorals, bracelets, rings and belts are the attributes of their social position. Gold had a symbolic function. It paved the way to power and immortality. It was a bridge between men and gods. The treasures were hidden in offerings to make the earth sacred and to protect it from invaders. This is why Thracian lands preserved so many invaluable objects. A Thracian king was forbidden from selling the objects making up his treasure. He had to be rich in the manner of King Midas Legend says that he was Thracian and had the ability to change what he touched into gold. Dozens of known masks from the Balkan Peninsula were made from gold sheets weighing no more than 100 grams. They represent the faces of the dead. This mask weighs nearly 700 grams and shows a living person with an authoritative cruel face and closed eyes, perhaps in a moment of meditation. What was the source of the unknown artist's inspiration? If you look at a map, you in fact notice that Europe is only one peninsula, the last peninsula of Asia. 
So, it is a kind of dead end surrounded on three sides by ice or sea. And from the moment when Europe was massively colonized towards 6500-6000 BC by these populations of farmers coming from the Middle East during every millennium that followed and up to present day, Europe was to constantly be a place where populations came together and were exchanges of useful goods as well as very long distance exchanges of luxury goods were made. That's Europe's recent history. Obviously, at the time, there were no roads. The wheel wasn't to be invented until around 4500 to 4000 BC with the chariot, just like the use of ox and the horse as plow animals. So, the routes were along rivers or through passes, such as used by pastoral farmers who practiced seasonal migration in the Balkans practically until the middle of the 20th century and even later. There is evidence of trade as far away as Denmark, the Ukraine, and Hungary up to 2,000 years before Christ. For example, copper bars were imported from Cyprus more than 2,000 kilometers away by Thracian boats. Ancient authors reported that the Thracians ruled the seas at the time. These anchors belonged to boats fitted with a mast and a single sail, and of course oars for 15 to 20 men. Homer gives a wonderful description of this in which he does not distinguish the Trojan ships from those of the Achaeans, the future Greeks. Drawings of such boats have been found in many places in our country. These ships were widely used and could transport goods and cattle. From our coasts, they sailed to Mycenaean Greece, that is to say the Peloponnesus Peninsula, and the large island of Crete. Antique written sources describe the Thracians more as pirates than as merchants transporting goods. The development of these exchanges required the use of currency. From the 4th to the 3rd century BC, the Thracian tribes used drachmas and staters from the Greek island of Thassos. The richest Thracian kings minted their own currency. They minted bronze coins thereafter, intended for the needs of the local population. In the majority of cases, Silver and gold coins were used for more important exchanges and international contracts. They used local symbols such as the bull, the horse, and the double-edged axe, typical of the culture, as well as Thracian beliefs and rites. Thracian civilization and its political and economic system could have continued to develop, leading to control of vaster kingdoms or an empire. But external factors caused setbacks. The Macedonian conquest with Philip and Alexander the Great, the incursions of the Persian Empire, and then more especially the Roman conquest, which was to be final as the Roman Empire came to establish itself for four centuries over the whole of southern Europe. Spartacus, who initiated the Great Slave Revolt in the Italian peninsula in 71 BC, was the last famous Thracian gladiator. And after having left their mark on history, where did these people go? It is difficult to say. They probably blended into the peoples who came later to settle in the Balkans. The land of the Thracians still has vestiges of the genius of this mysterious people. Plundered by thieves, melted down and resold for centuries, 
the gold of the Thracians continues to be dug up today in a seemingly never-ending supply. Before leaving you, let me tell you one last story. It is said that Alexander the Great came to consult the Thracian priest to know his future. In thanks, he is supposed to have offered them a gold chariot weighing 800 kilograms. According to the legend, this chariot is still hidden in the Bulgarian mountains. Perhaps it will be one of the most extraordinary finds that the mysterious land of the Thracians holds in store for us. New archaeological excavations certainly hold fabulous surprises. Hundreds of mounds, caves and sanctuaries have yet to be explored. The treasures they hold will continue to modify the history of modern civilization.